subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. You're welcome to the Senior High School R on your Joy Learning channel. Once again, I have the privilege and pleasure to present you a beautiful mathematics experience. It's good to have you with us. If this is your first time on the show, you're welcome. Well, if you've been one of our regulars, thanks for keeping faith with us. Today, we shall be continuing our second part of probability. In our first lesson, we covered the basics of probability. We defined all the important terms necessary for this level of your education. And so we looked at things like the sample space, a trial, an experiment. We went on to deal with the different laws governing probability. We talked about the addition law, the subtraction law. And we ended up with conditional probability. In between, we spoke about how to find probabilities with or without replacement. In this lesson, we shall continue from where we stopped. And so for today's lesson, we will be dealing with permutation, combination, and the application of same to with probabilities and binomial probability distribution specifically. When this lesson is done, it is my hope that together we will learn a number of things. My name is Danso, and this is, these are the things I would love you to understand by the end of the lesson. Hopefully we should get them together. So I will be hoping that together you will be able, will be able to determine arrangements and choices with or without regards to selection or order because there are some selections that deal with order there are some that do not bother about order so I'll be hoping that together we can find such arrangements such choices together we should be able to form and arrange items given specific conditions and constraints you know in life there are always constraints but for constraints, we would all be able to do everything, anyhow, anytime we wanted. Not too many of us have that privilege. So let's see how mathematically we can arrange things, given constraints. Then we should be able to apply the concept of permutations and combinations to determine probabilities. Finally, we should be able to determine probabilities of specific quantities under a condition of mutual exclusivity. We call that the binomial situation. When we get to that bridge, we will definitely cross it together. So once again, you're welcome. My name is Danso, and let's go get on to the right. All right, first concept, the factorial. What is the factorial? You notice on your screen, we have a symbol the exclamation mark. Well, it's one of the symbols we use in math. And what does it mean? We call it the factorial. Well, you probably remember factor. So what is the factorial? By definition, the factorial is the multiplication of whole number integers from the number in question to 1, to the number 1, or from 1 to the number in question. That is the factorial. I shall give you an example and you will get it. Get used to the terminologies because we shall be using them as we get on. So when we say, for example, 5 factorial, what do we mean by 5 factorial? And that's how it is read. The 5 with the exclamation mark is read 5 factorial, 5 factorial. 5 factorial will mean 1 by 2 by 3 by 4 by 5. So we are multiplying from whole number 1 until we get to 5. So we use positive integers, which are whole numbers, of course. So 
in my definition, I said it is the multiplication of whole numbers, whole number integers. Well, I could have just said integers, but so that you know that we don't deal with negatives. So we don't deal with negatives here. I could have just said whole numbers, but you probably will go and use the zero. And we'll talk about zero very shortly. So it's either we're multiplying from one to the number in question, or from the number in question backwards, which is the way we prefer to do it, until we get to one. So five factorial could be written as one by two by three by four and five. Or we would write five factorial as five by four by three by two by one. This is our preferred way of writing it because usually you know the number, so you just multiply, reducing until you get to one. So in general, if you have any number and you're supposed to have that number factorial, say seven factorial, it will be seven, and you keep reducing by one, so you get seven, then by reduce by one, six, so seven by six, by five, by four, until you get to one. So if the number were n, n, which is an arbitrary number, then you will have n multiplied by one less than n, which is n minus one, multiplied by two less than n, which is times n minus two, until we get to two times one, and then we ended there. However, there is something to quickly note. This often raises argument, but it's not really too difficult to explain. So note that one factorial is one, and that is not too difficult, because you know that one times nothing, or one is just one. But we also say zero factorial is one. And that is where usually the contention begins. Why is zero factorial one? Well, a quick way to try to explain it, maybe rather simplistic, is that in how many ways can you arrange nothing? Well, some people will say there is no way you can arrange nothing. Well, if I say there is nothing, in how many ways are you going to arrange nothing? Maybe there's only one way which is no way. So the answer is actually one. So that is zero factorial is also one. Well, I would have said check it on your calculator. And um, the, the factorial function is a second function. So you have to press your shift on your calculator. And then you look for a factorial sign, depending on your calculator and where it is. And then zero factorial, you'll find out that it is the same thing as one factorial, both cases your value will be one. Why do we begin with a factorial? It's because it goes into another concept, which is permutation. Well, not too sure you've had something too close to permutation unless you deal with the lottery. If you deal with the lottery, then maybe you have an idea of permin. So they usually will shorten it to perm. Well, permutation by definition, is the process or the arrangement and finding possible arrangement that exists for a group of items in a set. So if we have a group of items in a set and we want to see how many possible arrangements we can have, especially if those arrangements are in order, then we have a permutation. So a permutation is an arrangement of things taking order into consideration. It is an ordered selection. What do we mean by that? You know, if I had A, B, C, um, and I wanted to arrange it, I could begin A, C, B, or I could begin B, A, C, or I could begin C, B, A. In each case, although the three alphabets, A, B, and C, are maintained, their order has changed, and that is crucial. That is why, for example, if your password, four-digit password, were one, two, three, four, if you tried logging in with one, two, four, three, you'll be denied access. If you tried logging in with one, four, two, three, you'll be denied access. You must enter in that password 
in the exact order in which it must be one, two, three. So there, order is important. And in the banking sector, in cryptography, in any situation where security is important, usually a permutation is crucial. It helps to determine the length of your password. So for example, if you had a password for your email, which usually should not be less than eight characters, then um, it's going to be pretty difficult for anybody to guess your order of eight manually, unless they have a third party utility or some special knowledge by which they can tell what your password is. Because your password should constitute or be made up of alphabets, both lower and upper case, some special characters like underscore, dash, ampersand, etc. And so if you were to put all of those characters together and try to guess eight and in their exact proper order, that's a tall order for anybody, unless, like I said, the person has some superior knowledge, some foreknowledge, or if you like, some third party utility by which they can decode the exact order of your password. And so order is important in mathematics and we want to check what's the likelihood that anybody can access your account that has a password. And usually you would notice if you use an ATM or if you have a code that if you tried logging in more than a certain number of times, usually three, on your fourth or subsequent attempt, you'll be logged out. The reason is simple. The assumption is that whoever is trying to access it is not the original owner, else they would have known what it is. Well, if it proves that you are the original owner but you have forgotten, then you'll be asked security questions to be sure that it is you but you have forgotten. All right, and that is where mathematics becomes pretty cool. Don't you think so? All right, so let's see how it works. The idea is expressed as N permutation R. The N and P and R I will define, but they're written in these two different ways. Sometimes on the same line as it is. Sometimes the N and R are made superscripts and subscripts respectively. But it is denoted by N factorial, we are back to our factorial, divided by N minus R factorial. So take a quick note of that formula, that N permutation R, and that's how it is read, N permutation R is given as N factorial divided by N minus R all factorial. All right, so what, what is N and R? N is the total number of items you're considering. In the example I gave, if the alphabets, 26 of them, the English alphabet that is, 26 of them, and they have both upper and lower cases, then together you have 52. If we add the numbers or the numerals, we have 10. So that gives us 62. If we were to add even eight more characters, special characters, dash, ampersand, etc., that makes it 70 possibilities. So your n in that instance will be 70. And R is the items to be arranged. In this case, if the password says not less than eight, it means the minimum should be eight. You could have a password that is an entire poem and it is allowed because only the lower limit has been set eight. You could go as high as whatever you want. So if we stuck to eight, it means we have eight items to arrange from a possible 70. You get the idea now. If it, there were numbers and there were your password for, say, your mobile money account, there are 10 numerals, 0 to 9. And you have 4 to select from. So our N in that case would be 10, and our R will be 4. And it is in any order. You could repeat numbers, you could vary them, entirely your business. So in that case, we have 10 permutation 4. And it will be beautiful to see what it looks like on your calculator. Okay, so let's just take a very quick example. Look at this question. 
It says, in how many ways can the letters of the word air be rearranged? So, air itself is one arrangement. We could move it to IAR, we could move it to RIA, and all kinds of arrangements. Well, we have three letters to arrange, and we are arranging all three at the same time. So, it is three permutation three. Three total items, and we are arranging all, so our selection is entirely all. So that is three divided by the difference between three and three factorial. So that gives us three factorial divided by zero factorial. Recall that zero factorial is one. Three factorial will be three by two by one, because we keep reducing until we get to one. So there are six possible ways. You could do that manually if you wanted to. So we could have something like this. Air, you could have ARI, you could have RIA, you could have RAI, you could have IAR, you could have IRA. So you notice there are six of them one, two, three, four, five, and six. So there are six possible arrangements for the word. Air. And that's where permutation gets cool. Now, someone could say, but why do we have to bother doing some mathematics about this? Especially air, we could just arrange them. Well, if the word becomes longer, then you know you're going to be in trouble because it means you're going to have a long list. And I'm not sure you want that. So let's try another example. This time around, I'm not arranging alphabets. We will do a few more arrangements of alphabet. But there are five seats available at a reception, an office reception. Eight teenagers arrive at the same time. So there are five seats, but eight teenagers arrive at the same time. Whatever they are going to do at that office, we are not too sure, but they arrive. And the question is, in how many different ways can the seats be occupied? It means there are more people than six. So our n is eight, but we have five. It means at any given point in time, three people will be standing. Or three people would not have the full complement of the seat if they choose not to share the space. So in how many ways can this be shared? It means we can have the first group of five sit. That would be one arrangement. We can take off one person and let one of those who are standing go sit down, and all kinds of arrangement. Let's see how it works. Mathematically, that will look very simple. It will simply be eight permutation five. So we have eight total people, and we're going to arrange five at any given point in time. That gives us eight factorial divided by effectively three factorial. And if we were to do the division, we should get seven, 6,720 possible ways. That's quite a lot. Yes, so it shows how very interesting this can be. Imagine if we had to do this manually. We would have to do 6,720 different arrangements, and the possibility is that after the first 20 at most, we'll start getting it wrong, because it's not too easy to keep track of such arrangement. But the beauty of this is it tells you that there are many possible ways you could do anything, given your circumstance. Now, let me give you one that will probably make you smile. In how many ways can the word book be spelled or rearranged, if you like? Now, I want you to guess what it, what it will look like. Well, if you wrote 4 permutation 4, which is 4 permutation 4, if you did that, you'll be wrong. And I'll show you why you'll be wrong. So let's find out why we'll be wrong. Why would this be wrong? Let's, let's see why you'll be wrong. You'll be wrong because if you notice carefully, for the word book, two or one particular alphabet is repeated. That's the alphabet O. So although there are four letters that make up the word book, there is a repetition. So if we took out the two repeat, the repeated alphabet, O and O, we're left with two. 
So wherever there is a repetition, the number of repetitions must be taken out. Why? Because if you arrange it as B-O-K-O, there is no other arrangement for B-O-K-O because the O's are not distinguished unless you call one of them, say, O subscript 1 and O subscript 2. But we don't have O subscript 1 as an alphabet. It's simply O. So any repetition must be treated as such. It must be discarded of, so to speak. So this is technically for permutation 2. In other words, there are 12 possible ways the word book can be respelled or rearranged. Please take note of that. One more example on that, and I believe you will get it too. So, look at the word probability. In the word probability, if we count it, we'll find out that there are 11 different, or 11 alphabets that makes a word. So, P, R, O, 3, B, A, B, another 3, that's 6. I, L, I, another 3, makes it 9. Then T, Y, 11. So, that is 11 possibilities. But, we notice something curious. B is repeated. So two Bs, I is also repeated, two I's. Now, because of that repetition, our permutation will read 11 permutation, or if you like, 11 factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial. And those two come from two Bs, two I's. So if there were three Bs, like in the word bubble, then it would have been three. Do you get it? So it would have divided it by three because for those three, there'll be a repetition. So bubble. In the word bubble, there should be six alphabets. And so it will be six factorial divided by three factorial. Actually, we could have written one factorial for each of the others, but there is no need one factorial is one. So in this case, the number of ways the word probability can be spelled or rearranged is as much as 9,979,200 ways. That's a big one, right? A real big one. Good. So you're getting the idea now. So just check. How many times does the word repeat itself? Divided by the total number. And if there are many of such alphabets, sorry, that repeat themselves, then keep dividing it, it doesn't matter. So in the word hippopotamus, count how many P's, how many S, how many, whatever alphabets repeat themselves, count and divide. Okay, now look at this. In permutations, we can do a restrictive permutation and non-restrictive permutation. Let's try to distinguish them. So I could arrange items in a straight line, in a straight line. We could arrange items around a circle. We could group items or leave them ungrouped. We could also have the items fixed in position or freely moving. A few examples will let you appreciate all of this. And there are many, many ways of doing it. So whenever you encounter a permutation problem or a problem that seeks to demand for you to arrange, and that's the key word, arrange, always ask yourself, is there a constraint? Is the thing in a straight line? Is it in a circle form? Is it movable or fixed? A few examples, and you'll see how to work with them. So, for example, at a party, six people are to sit on a couch. In how many ways can they be seated if, so you see, the constraint is about to be introduced, and there are a number of constraints, a number of possible constraints here. So, the key thing is that there is a party, and there are six people at the party, maybe more, but these six people sit on a couch. We don't know the nature of the couch. And why should that be important for math? It's not just because we like to arrange people on a couch, 
but it gives us an idea of a number of things, including forensics. So for example, we should be able to tell if at the party there was some poisoning, hopefully you won't encounter that, or whatever. The forensic scientist is going to have to employ this mathematical principle to determine where could this person have sat and the other person sat. If there was touch wood, a gun battle, and there was a shot, somebody needs to find out the possibility of where somebody sat so that where did the gunshot come from, who would it have hit possibly, and all of that. And it's a mathematical thing, believe me. Okay, so what are the conditions here? Six people sit on a couch. In how many ways can they be seated if there are no restrictions? If two particular people must sit next to each other, if two particular people must not sit next to each other, and if the couch is exchanged for a round table, so the assumption here is that the couch is a linear one, straight. It's not round. And even if it is curved, so long as it's not a full circle, what is the probability that, or how many people, as it were, in how many ways can they be seated in that couch if it's not round? Let's begin with the first scenario. When there are no restrictions, this is what happens. The six people can sit in six different ways or six factorial. In other words, we can rearrange them on the couch in at least 720 ways. In at least 720 ways. Because six factorial will be six multiplied by five, multiplied by four, multiplied by three, multiplied by two, and finally by one. That will give you 720. So at the party, these six people have the opportunity to sit in 720 different ways, depending on if somebody wanted to try that experiment at the party. And so, the 720 possible ways means a lot. It means that if something happened, it's going to be pretty difficult without any other information to tell who was sitting where and when. All right, so that is our first condition satisfied. We now know what it feels like, or what it would be like, if they sat on a straight couch. Now, what happens if Two particular people must sit next to each other. Well, we don't know why they insist on sitting together or why anybody would insist they should sit together. But well, that is what we have. What is the arrangement? In how many ways can they be seated if two people must sit next to each other? Well, now think about it this way, and this is how to appreciate it. Imagine there are six people at um, a bus station they have just, um, or at the airport, they have just disembarked from a flight. And there are, there are taxis available. And each one of them is supposed to pick one taxi. They are not supposed to share space, for example. Well, ordinarily, that would mean six taxis. And not just six taxis. The six people could have chosen the taxis in six different orders. So that would have been 720 different possible order or arrangement for the taxis. If we label the taxis, taxi one, all the way to taxi six, it could be in any possible way. But this scenario is a bit different. Two people decide they're going to board the same taxi. Well, it means that we do not need six taxis. How many taxis would we need? First of all, if we took the two people out, it means the other four people can board one taxi separately. So that is four different possible ways, so four factorial. But that is not all. The two people will now board one taxi. So in other words, we have five taxis. So it means we don't need a set taxi. Four people, each one boarding separately, four taxis. Two people boarding one taxi, in addition to the four, five taxis. But that is not all. The two people sitting in taxi can be seated in two different ways. One could be on the left, the other on the right, or the same taxi, but it can change positions. So you get the idea now. Or maybe one sits in front, one at the back. So different ways they could share the taxi. So let's understand that now. So in our solution, we say that they can sit in two ways for the two people. So in all, we have two factorial, 
which is the two different ways the two people could sit in one taxi, multiplied by the five different selections of taxis. Do you get the idea? The two people will sit in one taxi, the one could sit in front, the other could sit behind. Alternatively, the one who sat in front could come behind, and the one who was behind the driver comes in front. Those are two different selections. But for the five taxis that they will all use, they could also be arranged in five different, five factorial ways. So we have two factorial multiplied by five factorial. Five factorial is 120 multiplied by two factorial, which is two, gives us 240 possible ways. So think of sitting at the party where six people sit on the couch, but two people must always sit together in the same way. So you consider the six people no longer are six, but five, because two have become one. So we have four separate people plus two people who have decided to be moved at the same time. So we have five. But those two people, one could sit to the left, the other to the right, or vice versa. So they can sit in two different ways in each arrangement. So we have 240 possible ways. Now, these are the things that make this topic kind of tricky. The clue here is to read the question well, understand the constraints. They sit on the couch, no restrictions, just go, six factorial or whatever number. But the moment you hear two particular people must sit next to each other, then you start doing that reasoning I gave you. All right, the third one. Two particular people must not sit next to each other. In other words, in any arrangement you make, two particular people, for whatever reason, should not be next to each other. Well, there is a longish way of doing it. The longish way is to say, okay, I hold one person, and if that person and person B must not sit together, every time I arrange, I'll make sure that they are not together. So person A, then maybe person C, D, E, F, then person, say, B, or person B, then person A is somewhere else, but they should never be together. That's rather longish. That's a simple way. The simple way is to say, what would it look like if there was no restriction? What would it look like if two of them sat together? Subtract the second scenario from the first. So we simply say the number of ways without restrictions minus the number of ways if both sat next to each other. That would be the number of ways it would look like if two of them should not sit next to each other. So we we'll simply say 720, which was our first answer, where there was no restriction, minus 240 when both of them sit together. Our answer will give us 480 ways. In other words, there are 480 possible ways for these six people to sit on a couch where two particular people would not sit next to each other. So whatever reason, 480 ways. So no restriction minus they are together gives us the value for when they must not sit together. Our fourth scenario. Well, at that meeting, they were sitting on a couch. But maybe they wanted to play a game, maybe a game of cards, whatever game. And so they take out the couch and bring a table. Now, in how many possible ways can they be arranged around the table? One way will be fine, but maybe somebody doesn't want to face the other person. How do we do that kind of arrangement? Well, it's a pretty straightforward one. When you have to arrange things in a secular form or in a circle, what you must do and attempt it at home, you will find out that if you keep arranging, they will keep looking the same all the time. That's the uniqueness of a circle. If you remember your core math, we say that a circle is the locus of a point equidistant from a reference point. That definition implies that the circle looks alike I mean, similar or the same, no matter where you're looking at it from. That's the uniqueness of circles. So when you're arranging things or people in a circular form, the only way for them to look different is to hold one and make it fixed. 
whereas the others can be moved. When you do that, then they will truly be different. So the six people sitting around the couch, you must hold one of them still while the rest are moved in different ways. Then you see how many possible ways they can be rearranged. So it will be six minus one all factorial where the minus one is the person you have fixed. That person can only be in that position. All the other five can move around. So it's a six minus one or factorial. So there are 120 possible ways to make that happen. All right, let's form numbers with digits. Now, this is another curious one where permutation comes alive. Now, we have the numbers zero, three, and four. And the question says, how many different even numbers greater than 300 can be formed from the digits 0, 3, and 4. So we have 0, 3, 4. And the question says we ought to form different even numbers greater than 300. These are the constraints. The numbers ought to be different, they ought to be even numbers. And they ought to be greater than 300. And the question says, how do we do it with repetition and without repetition? With repetition means if I use the number 0, I can use it again. Or without repetition means if I use 3, for example, I cannot use it again. Let's deal with the first instance. In the first instance, I draw my three dashes. And those three dashes is because the number is 300. It's a three-digit number, 3, 0, and 0. And the, I'm going to go with the constraint. So watch how we're going to do it. The numbers have to be even numbers. They have to be greater than 300. If I'm going to use 0, 3, and 4, what it means is for the number to be greater than 300, it cannot start with 0. Any number beginning with 0 will be less than 300. So based on the digits I have been provided with, only 3 and 4 can begin. In other words, there are two possibilities there. So either 3 or 4. So two possible numbers can start. That is the first thing. So the number must be greater than 300. But there is something else. The number ought to be even. For a number to be even, it must end with either 0 or a number divisible by 2. So that is the other concept. So look at the numbers provided. And remember, it is with repetition. So it doesn't matter what number I began with, I can still use that same number. So I must go to the end now, because for a number to be even or odd, the end determines it. So this time around, at the end, which, two, which numbers would, must end this so that it is even? 0 and 4, so two possible numbers. And then the middle space. Since it is with repetition, I can use all three numbers again. So I could have, for example, I could have 300. Zero, zero. And it doesn't matter. So what do I do with all this 2, 3, and 3? I multiply them. And my final answer is 12. It means that I can have 12 different even numbers greater than 300 if I was to form the numbers from the, I mean, from the digits 0, 3, and 4. You get the trick now. OK, now what about if I was to do it without repetition? What that would mean is I do not have the liberty of using a number I have used once. Once used, forever gone. OK, without repetition. Now this time around, I'm, I'll have to think th through it. If I cannot use a number more than once, a number of things happen. And the number has to be greater than 300. And it has to be even. So what I must do must be a careful thought. And please, for each question, it comes with its own thought process. So here, I'm going to begin. I know that 3 must begin, or 4. So let's begin with 3. If I begin with 3, it means I have only one possibility. Remember, there are two numbers that could begin, either 3 or 4. So I'm beginning with 3. If I begin with 3, it means I have only one. The moment I use 3, what number must end it? It could be 0 or 4. So two possibilities there. 
Now, if I used, say, 0, I cannot repeat 0. If I used 4, I cannot repeat 4. I have used two different numbers, so I must be left with only one more number. So, my final answer, not my final, my intermediate answer will be 2. But that is because I began using 3. What if I tried using 4? Again, I have settled for 3. What happens with 3? If I begin with 4, it means only 4 fills that space. But I need the number to be even. So my last digit is important. If I've used 4, it means I'm left with only one more number or one more digit that can fill that space. 3 cannot fill that space. If I put 3 there, the number becomes odd. So the only other number I can use since I've already used 4 is 0. So it can be filled only with 1. Now I've used two different numbers. I have three digits, sorry. So it can only be filled, the middle space can be filled with only one more digit. Well, if I multiply all of that, I have one. So when I use three to begin the number, I have two possibilities. If I use four, one possibility. So the total number I'll add and I have three. In other words, there are three different even numbers I can form using the digits 0, 3, and 4, which will be greater than 300, and they will be even if I do not repeat the digits. I hope you followed so far. Great. So this is another one. We're supposed to form different odd numbers greater than 20,000 from the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Same pattern. If the digits can be repeated, if the digits cannot be repeated. I'll deal with the first one. I'll leave you to resolve the second one from the illustration I gave you. I'll give you a hint though so that you can try it, okay? Okay, so solution. I have, in 20,000, I have five places, five digits. So I have my five red lines over there. The number has to be odd. It has to be greater than 20,000. In other words, the number cannot begin with 0. It cannot begin with 1. If it begins with 1, it would be less than 20,000. So it must begin with either 2 or 3 or 4. So there are three possibilities there for the first one. The number has to be odd. It means that the last digit cannot be 0 or a digit divisible by 2. So if we took out 0, we took out 2 and we took out 4. We are left with only 1 and 3. So two possibilities at the end. Well, recall the question says that if the digits can be repeated. So it does not matter that I have used certain digits earlier. I can repeat them. For example, if I use 2, I can have 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. In other words, I could have 22,222. It will still be greater than 20,000. I could use 23222, 23,222. So it doesn't matter that I have used them if I can repeat them. So all five numbers qualify for all the spaces. Well, if we multiply that as previously, we should have 750 different odd numbers greater than 20,000 formed from the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, I said I was not going to solve the second one because I want you to try it. But I'll give you the hint. The hint is to go back to our previous example. Recall that it says the digits cannot be repeated. So it means the moment you've used one, it is out of the question. So your numbers reduce from five different digits. You now have four. And always remember, the number has to be odd. So your last digit. So if you picked an odd number first, it means that number is gone. And your total number has reduced again. So I want you to resolve that, and it would be great to know what your answers are. So that has been permutation. We'll move on to combinations. What is combination? It is much like permutation, except that in combination, we are selecting and arranging things, and we are not interested in the order. You recall when we arranged air, A-I-R, it was not the same thing as A-R-I. In combination, we don't care. So long as the three of them appear, we are cool. 
we consider them the same. So we are not too interested in whether the A came before I or I comes before R. So long as A, I, and R appear, we are OK. So it is the process and result of selecting items from a set, regardless of the order of selection. We write it mathematically with these symbols. N combination R written that way, or N and R as superscript and subscript. The C means combination. Or we simply write it as, as N, R in the kind of vector form. Now, it is given by N factorial divided by N minus R factorial, R factorial n factorial divided by n minus r or factorial, r factorial. As usual, the n is the total number of items in the set, and r are the items to be arranged. So depending on the circumstance, your n and r will have their own different values. So I want you to observe something. And the observation I want you to note, and this is a very important one, and please note it. Note it, it's very crucial that you note this, because especially in your final year, you have multiple choice questions that involve the use of this identity, where n combination r is one and the same, or equivalent to n permutation r divided by r factorial. I, I hope you get the idea. Why is it so? It's because n combination r, which we know as n factorial divided by n minus r all factorial multiplied by r factorial, if we divided it by r factorial, we would have n factorial all over n minus r factorial times 1 over r factorial. You get the idea. Because n permit um, n permutation r is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. So this effectively is this. So all of that divided by r factorial. So we get back to the original thing. I hope you get the idea now. So. It is a very important identity to note that n combination r is the same thing as n permutation r divided by r factorial. OK, if you have that out of the way, when we say 7 combination 2, for example, numerically, what would it look like? It would be 7 factorial divided by 7 minus 2 factorial, 2 factorial. The clue for combination is that every time you add the denominator, it must give you the numerator. So 5, 2 will give you 7. OK. And if you work that out, you notice I have put the denominators in parentheses. It's because um, when you put it this way, it makes it a lot easier. So for example, 5 factorial will be 5 by 4 by 3 by 2 by 1. You notice that it takes out itself and all of this. So it's easy to calculate. And then 2 factorial. 2 would take out, say, 6, and you would have 3. So our final answer in this case would be 21. So often, we would not have to write all of this. We could simply write it as 7 by 6 by 5 factorial divided by 5 factorial multiplied by 2 by 1. So you could just take out the 5 factorial and 5 factorial because all of this was 5 factorial anyway. You get the idea now. So instead of writing it longish all the time, if you look at the denominator, I notice, oh, there's something that I, you could take out. Just reduce it to that level, and you'll be fine. So that's a 7 combination 2. OK. Now let's do one that is very great. So look at this premise. Of the question. A football coach, all right, um, the coach for the Ghana Black Stars, S. Mr. Chris Hilton, 
He is to choose 10 more players to make his starting lineup for a team of 23 go 23 non goalkeepers. So he has defenders, attackers, midfielders, but he already has his goalkeeper. And he needs to make a selection of 10 more people, but he has 23. And um, let's say everybody can play every role. That's the caveat I'm given. Mr. Hilton has to make his selection. I don't know who your team coach is. Maybe you're of Nigerian or you're in Nigeria, you support Nigeria. I don't know who the coach is, but imagine that coach is going to make such a selection. Now, how many possible player combinations can he have for his team? Well, let's check it out. 23 will be our N, and 10 will be our R, because we need to take only 10 out of the possible 23. All right. So we have 23 combination 10, which will be 23 factorial divided by 23 minus 10 factorial, 10 factorial. That gives us 23 factorial divided by 13 factorial, 10 factorial. Believe me, the answer is awesome. We have 1 million... 144,066 possible player combinations. In other words, if Mr. Hilton wanted to arrange so that all 23 players have equal opportunities, assuming they are all fit, they can all play all positions, it means that he could choose them or select them in at least, in at least 1 million ways. In fact, precisely 1,144,066 possible ways. Now, what that means is this. If he chose only one of such combinations, he has to now justify that to 1,144,065 different such combinations. And that is the challenge of any coach or anybody making selections because you only have one of such opportunities whereas there are many more possible combinations and everybody could justify their reasons for including or excluding somebody so that is the player combination this time around order is not important it doesn't matter if you pick a defender first before he picked a midfielder so long as they're on the team those 10 people qualify and that's a challenge well you are a boss and you have to appoint people to offices they are all qualified and there are only a few spaces, and there are many people qualified. Well, recently in Ghana, we are placing students in high schools. Tens of thousands of people wrote the exams. Well, we do not have spaces for everybody, and how they want it in what school. So there must be some selection criteria. Well, this is some of the ways it happens. You may not like the idea, but hey, that's how it works. There are constraints. All right, so those are combinations. Okay, so we have a question here, and this is quite a typical one, so let's run through this. So a bag contains 16 identical objects. We don't know what they are, but there are seven of them black, five red, and the rest are white. Three of the objects have to be selected at random from the bag at once. Find the probability that one is black, one is red, and the remaining is white. Let's go straight to the solution. There are 16 items, seven black, five red. Number of white will have to be four because the question says the rest are white. So seven plus four, five, 12. 12 from the total number 16 leaves us with four. If we're gonna have one red, one black, one white, we'll say seven combination one, that means one black, five combination one, one red, and four combination one, which is one white. Out of 16 combination three. Why 16 combination three? Because we have 16 items and we have to pick three at once. For the numerator, we're picking one, 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 one of each. So seven combination one, five combination one, four combination one. If we add seven plus five plus 12, we get 16. One, one, one gives us three. So in all, we have seven by five by four divided by 560. And that gives us 1 over 4. So the probabilities, and this apl applying combination, the probability of picking one of each color is 1 on 4. Let's try the second part. 
exactly two block. Remember, we're picking three of the items. Two block means we're picking two block and one that is non block. Okay, so two block would be seven combination two because there are seven blocks. In how many ways can we pick two, seven combination two? But after we've picked after we have picked from the seven blocks, we have nine that are not black, five of which are red, four white. So nine combination one. Of the nine in that group, one, we're picking only one. So we have 21 by nine divided by 560, which gives us 27 on 80. That's the probability of picking two black. All right, but this same thing can be solved in another way. We can say that the alternative method of solving it is to say, well, we pick two black, one red, or where this is or, the addition, two black and one white. So we go through the same process. Seven combination two for two black in each case. And then since the first one is red, there are five reds, so five combination one. In the second case, it will be four combination one because it's white. If we added both, we'll get the same answer like previously. 27 on 80. So that is how to work with probability. The third part of the question says, probability that none is white, that none is white. It means that we don't want to white at all. Well, probability that none is white means that all three are not white. Well, how many whites do we have? We have four whites. The non whites will be 12, because that will give us seven black, five reds, that's 12. So 12 combination three, we have excluded the white entirely. The other way was to find how many will be all whites minus probability that there was no restriction to still give us the same thing. So here we have 11 on 28. Remember, we have 12 combination three because non-whites are 12. The whites were four. So non-whites would be four from 16, that would be 12. For the denominator, it remains the same all the time. We're picking three out of 16. Okay. Now we go to the final phase of our class. If you just join us at this point, you have missed quite a bit. But let's tie up with you on this. Often, in probabilities, we have so many options to pick from. For example, in our last example, we treated a situation where we had three different objects or Objects of the same shape, size, but different colors, red, white, black. Now, we could have, we, we had a situation where we said we want non-white. So we could just say white and non-white. Where non-white would have been red plus black. So there are situations where we can group things. For example, you have a die. If you roll the die, you would have six possibilities. But we could say, what is the probability of picking a two or not a two, rolling a two or not a two? In which case, one, three, four, five, and six will be not two. That is a binomial situation. Generally, we say that if you have a yes or no, true or false, success or failure, then you have a binomial situation. Usually, we will call success one and failure zero. And please note, the word success and failure are not in the sense you would use them in your ordinary English. Success does not mean it's a good thing necessarily. It just means that is what you desired. What you desired may not be good, but it is success because that is what you wanted. So it is mathematically represented this way. Probability that an event X would occur Given that it's a binomial situation where it could be grouped as this or that, black and white, black or white, is n combination r multiplied by p exponent n multiplied by q exponent n minus r. What is p, q, r, n, and all of that? Well, let's define the terms. n combination r, we know what that is. p is probability of success. q is probability of failure. You recall in our first lesson, we say probability that an event will occur plus the probability that it will not occur is equal to one. So if I know one, I can make a change of subject. If I know probability of success, 
then probability of failure will be 1 minus probability of failure of success. So probability of success plus probability of failure is equal to 1. So if I know success and I want to find failure, 1 minus probability of success is probability of failure. So if Q is failure, then it is 1 minus P. N is number of trials. And X is the number of successes in N trials that we hope to find. A quick example here. In every 20 male students in a boarding school, one in every 20 belongs to the gentleman's club. There's a club like that. Now, question is, what is the probability that if 12 male students are picked at random, four of them are members of the club? So there is a club. But we don't know who is a member and who is not. But what we know is that in the school, one out of 20, so let's say the school, there are 100. It means five of them are members of the club. If there are 1,000, one out of 20 means that there are probably 50 of them who are members of the club. OK, so probability that if we pick 12 males at random without knowing exactly what, whether or not they are in that club, what would be the probability that four out of that 12 will be in the club? And at least 10 out of the 12 will be in the club. Or none of them, none of the 12. Well, these are our solutions. We have our key factors. N is 12 because those are the number of people we picked. And the question says four of them are members. So R is 4. We also have the second situation to be at least 10, which is greater than or equal to 10. And none of them, which is 0. Now P, our success rate, the question gives us. It says 1 out of every 20. So 1 divided by 20, or 0 0.05. In other words, Q will be 1 minus P, which will be 0 0.95. So, if we were to solve that, probability that it's equal to x would be just replacing the values. 12 combination 4, this is p, exponent n, which is 4, or r, 4. q, 0 0.95 exponent 12 minus 4. That will give us the values there. And if you use your calculator, your final answer will be approximately 0 0.00205. So that is the probability that of the 12 male students we pick at random, four of them will be in the gentleman's club. Well, at least 10 of them means that we have at least 10 will mean 10, 11, or all 12. Again, all you do is the substitution. So you substitute the values. Now. This time around, you're going to have three values, because at least 10 means 10, 11, 12. So we have 12 combination 10, 12 combination 11, 12 combination 12. And our P and Q are all the same, but the powers change. So the first time it is 10, subsequently it is 12, I mean 10, next time it's 11, and it's 12. So if we arrange those values, we should have a very longish calculation there. Not too interested in the precise value, just so that you understand the procedure. So you notice 10, 11, 12. 10, 11, 12. 10, 2, 11, 1, 12, 0. So our powers for P keep increasing, while the powers for Q keep decreasing. In each case, a test is to Add 10 to 2, you should get 12. 11 to 1, you get 12. And 12 to 0, you get 12. Remember the formula again. It says that P of X is equal to N combination R multiplied by P exponent R, Q exponent N minus R. Keep that in mind all the time. All right. If we finish up this, we should have... A very longish one. It means the possibility of having at least 10 of them in the club is so slim it's almost zero. And um, we have similar questions like this. An agro-scientist develops highly resistant crops and the maturity, the probability that each seed will survive to maturity is 0.9. Eight seeds are planted. Probability that less than two would mature. So maturity is all to survival is 0 0.9. It means that failure will be 0 0.1. And then you can do all your calculation as usual. So less than two will mature. So less than two. 
will be either 0 or 1. And you get your answer there. All right, so what are our takeaways? We have learned that we can arrange items, taking them the order into consideration that is permutation, or regardless of the order, combination. We've said that in arranging items, you must be careful about the constraints. Odd, even, three digits, greater than, in a straight line, around the table. Two possible outcomes for any probability will give us a probability, binomial probability distribution. And then we say that this, all of these have practical everyday applications. I'll leave you with an exercise to do. And um, I hope that you get this down. And um, let's talk. Visit us on our channels, Joy Learning TV, Senior High School R, on our Facebook channels. Let's know how you fared trying to resolve these problems of Valentine, people on a committee, probability of odds on a team, etc. It's been a pleasure bringing you probabilities on your senior high school R. My name is Danso. I hope to be with you again for another interesting rendezvous. See you soon. Keep learning. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.